Subscribe for more amazing tips, interviews, and wisdom from my phenomenal guests. And get your free copy of my five-day meal plan and exercise ebook at realketonesaustralia.com. Hi, I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces operator, high-performance living coach from eatwellmovewell.net. And you can listen to my Straight to Up Mind and Muscle podcast today, sponsored by armsads.com. Today, Tony Blower, the father of modern day scientific self-defense, teaching people how to choose courage. Tony is one of the few combatives experts who has successfully affected training across all the combat related communities, self-defense, combat sports, and the military and law enforcement sector. Featured on the cover of pretty much every martial arts magazine in the past, I wanted to find out how Tony has brought his life-saving craft into the modern era and successfully navigated the post-2022 lockdowns and his answers are inspirational. I asked Tony about such things as the difference between martial arts and actual combat, mindset versus skill set, and how he invented the spare garage gym. Now, some of the wisdom you'll hear and learn about in this show are only those who manage their fear manage the fight. Make fear your co-pilot, not your backseat driver. The mind navigates the body. And instinct, intuition, and intelligence. Tony spoke with such wisdom and passion and is a wealth of knowledge and it was an honor to share some of his story on the show today. You can find more about Tony at his main website, blowertrainingsystems.com. Check out the show notes, the, the links are there, but you've got blowertrainingsystems.com, B-L-A-U-E-R, trainingsystems.com. And my personal favorite, the Garage Gym Self Defense, which is blowerspear.com, B-L-A-U-E-R-S-P-E-A-R.com. And of course, he's on Instagram at Spear System. Here's a quote from Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, US Army retired, the director of some phenomenal uh, institutions, the Killology, Killology Research Group, and the author of On Killing and On Combat. Here's the quote. When the history of this warrior rena renaissance, this golden age of warriors is written, Tony Blair will be remembered as one of the great pioneers who propelled us forward to the next evolutionary step in warriorhood. Thanks for watching and listening. Enjoy the show. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast. And welcome to my guest, Tony Blair. Tony, it's great to see you. Hey, Damien, thanks. It's so, so good to be here, man. We finally made it happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. Thank you so much. I mean, um, I'm just saying, I, I get to interview all these top people, and um, for years, Tony, I've I've watched your progress, and you're, you're this guy on a pedestal. But one little reach out and and the humility that people show to come on and and have a, t a talk here is great. So it's a real honor to have you on. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, uh, a, a lot of it, like like anything in life, is how you ask people. And, uh, you know, you, you, you've got a, a reputation, a background, a mission, a story. Uh, it makes it easier. But I've been hit up. It's funny. I've been hit up by people who have, like, you know, zero followers just starting out. And it's how they ask. I'll go on. There, there's very few people, you know, because they, they, they come with, you know, open hands. Hey, I'm just starting. This isn't, I know you're busy. It would really, and I'm like, because I, I had people ask me like some well-known people where i said hey um i'd love to interview on the no fear podcast and i'm a known entity them to them through my combatives training military law enforcement and these guys are out now and i had the audacity of some of them to ask me for my demographics what's the reach of my podcast <laughs> and i'm like uh how about go fuck yourself right? <laughs> like, i just but but that experience years ago made me, I was able to see it from the other side where I'm not going to, I'm not going to go, but they mean like, you know, you, you hit me up when you've got 5,000 followers. I just want to meet you and have a talk with you. And, and uh, the 
and through the podcast, I've actually developed like relationships where we just stay in touch with people, uh, you know, hang out and, and just connect and network. It's great. Yeah, it is amazing. The, um, the power of the internet, the power of video, which video gets the message across so well, but I'm getting the idea, Tony, that you and I love to help people. And if, if only one person uh, gets something from this show and it in this context maybe saves their life, we've done our job from having a, a little chat for a little bit. Well, just a bit. And, and even the one minute we just talked about, about how you ask. Yeah. He listens to that and goes, oh, I was just about to say, hey, to somebody as, as opposed to excuse me. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really about, you know, people ask me who my mentors are. And, and, and I go like, like, like everywhere, like even bad examples mentor you, good examples mentor you. And, and it could just be like a fleeting moment, a line in a book, uh, you know, some really intelligent uh, uh, street graffiti where you read that and you're like, holy shit. And, and it, everything can be a spiritual guide if you're open to it. So. Exactly. If you're open. I wanted to do something I don't often do on the show is straight away tell the listeners and the viewers where to find you because you know you've got a new insta channel coming up so straight away people are listening and then we're going to go to the background and go to all the all the goal but i know you've got spear systems or spear garage gym but let's just talk about where to find you on insta and where to find you straight away in case people are just jumping on quickly and going to, sure. to watch it later so uh i'm on all the social media channels just just if you if you type in my name tony blauer b-l-a-u-e-r there apparently, and I'm not this famous, I don't know why, but apparently there's three or four fake Tony Blauer accounts trying to uh, get people uh, uh, financial advice through crypto. Hey, message me in WhatsApp. Uh, I will never do that. I'll take your money for other things, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, it'll be for training. Uh, but uh, it's only uh, Tony Blauer on Instagram, or if you go to my main page, Tony Blauer, and you might get a warning from from Instagram because I'm regularly shadow banned and censored because I'm I'm obviously a threat to the new world order because I teach people to manage fear and think critically. But um, it's interesting. Uh, uh, so that page will take you to all of my Instagram. We've got four, one for my equipment, one for our, our actual tactical training, uh, our Spear Garage Gym, which is actually, I could spin the camera, give you a tour. Like this is, this is th that, and that's an amazing story. And maybe we'll get into it a little yeah. bit after we starting to teach in the garage again. Um, and, uh, and then I'm on LinkedIn and in Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. Also. Cool. Thanks, Tony. And we'll put it on the show notes. I'm just trying to get that straight across because people are actually on a podcast or on a video to hear that or see that. So I think it's sure. important. Well, let's get right into it. Can we go through your history? Um, and just a brief overview of, you know, I know you started martial arts when you're young, but for the people that don't know who you are and what you do, and I like to think really the father of modern self-defense. Um, Thank you. I never you know, heard that. Can we, can we can I marinate that a little bit? Yeah, it, it, it's funny you ask me for my history. I got to remind your 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 listeners. I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty old right now, so this might take a while. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, the father of modern self defense. I might uh, I might have you send me a, a, a. I'll pay for it, but send me a plaque and I'll put that up in my office. <laughs> I don't say it lightly, Tony. I so first off, um, amazing to have you on the show. Like I said, but. I interview the best people in the world or what they do or a clique of those. And, and it's true. We've managed to find the right guys. But, you know, I, I think in this 2022 world, it's not the World War II combatives that, that I, I learned uh, in the Special Forces and we can use for certain things. But the way you're applying it scientifically, psychologically, uh, and then teaching it in a way that the mum, the, the teenager mm -hmm. wants to come and learn – that's what I'm saying. The father of the modern self-defense. It's um, it's interesting. But let's find out how that how the hell you learned to do that. Sure. How did you get to here? It, it, it's neat, and I actually, uh, you know, I can't wait to share. I, I mean, I hope the conversation uh, continues to <laughs> to get better here. But like, it's such a neat thing. I've I've never heard of that. I've never thought about that. So I'm I'm truly uh, honored and and humbled by that. And the answer and the explanation like you teed it up perfectly 
because I abhor violence. I'm afraid of violence. And because I'm afraid of the danger and afraid of the risk, I prepare for it. And, and as a young athlete, as a young kid growing up in the 60s, uh, you know, I, I was an all-around athlete, but I was afraid of fear. And none of my coaches and my parents, and still even today, I don't like how people teach people to manage fear. I shouldn't say I don't like it. I think we could do a better job. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I, it doesn't need to be pedantic. And I use that word on purpose because most people don't know what pedantic means. And that's what it is. It's you go to a sports psychologist and he says, well, you know, there's this part of your amygdala that you're like, hold on a second. <laughs> I need to hit a home run. I need to get up that mountain. I need to ask this person for a date. I need to, you know, uh, quit my job. I need to get a divorce. I need to get married. I'm dealing with fear. Don't talk to me about amygdala, fight, flight, freeze, uh, uh, arousal. Uh, I think that the experts... Um, do a disservice, unintentional, do a disservice to the lay person who just wants to, we just want to perform better. Well, that's the difference between a teacher and an expert though, Tony, and you're a teacher. Yeah, and I go one step further, thank you for noticing that, is because uh, I make this joke in our train the trainer courses, we talk about SME, subject matter experts, right? A term you're intimate with coming from the military background. But when I came in and I started teaching in 1993 is when we started teaching military and law enforcement, I said, hey, how many of you want to be an SME? And it's like, oh, yeah. I said, well, in my classes, you're not a subject matter expert. You're a substance matters expert. You're going to understand why we do things, where it came from, why, why the change, because then you could lean into it. You're not like, hey, why are we doing this? Well, because I memorized that because some expert told me. And I, I make this joke, Damien, like an expert is somebody who's memorized someone else's material. I really wanted people to understand why we're doing things. But that, back to your, your question, how this started, my relationship with fear planted a seed for everything. I mean, I got crazy stories from, uh, you know, uh, fights when I was 12 years old uh, to competing in wrestling to competing as a high level skier uh, and never, never hit that proverbial flow state like that they caught, you know, they talk about it now, yeah. um, even though I do well and I'd have moments, but I was always afraid of this, like, why am I breathing like this? Why is my heart pounding? Why am I, why are my hands sweaty? I'm on the top of a mountain about the race. It's below zero and I'm yeah. fucking sweating and no one ever said, hey, that's just physiology. That's the anticipation of danger or risk. It's because you care so much that you've got performance anxiety. No, nobody, and, and now all the decades later, like I've got a team that travels around the world uh, sharing my research and system. And I'd all, I, be, a, a ritual of ours is before every single course, you know, we get on a call on Sunday, how are you doing, how are you feeling? And depending on who the audience or where they're doing or how much like ring less they have because they haven't been on the road or whatever, like all of them know it's okay to say to me, I'm fucking nervous. Wow. I, and I, and these are like guys that have been gunfights. These are guys yeah. that are like, I have one guy, this guy, Dave Boyle. He's a professional stuntman. He was a street fighter in Ireland, lives in Ireland. He worked the, the pubs there. Uh, he's, and he's a professional stuntman, jumps off buildings on fire. He works on big movies. Uh, he was a competitive kickboxer. I mean, if you looked at him, you'd go, that guy scraps. Like he just, you, like he blocked <laughs> a lot of punches with his face at some point. <laughs> and and uh, so he's doing this on, on Damien, an online course. So we do this two hour course called Essentials of Personal Safety. And it's just about how to augment your situational awareness, how to manage fear, and then things you can do at your door, by your car, just ideas. And it's usually attended by families who like aren't sure where to go just to plant some seeds. So because we do it all over the world, online, live, I got trainers in different time zones. It was Dave's first one. I hit him up on WhatsApp. I'm like, dude, you ready? He goes, yeah. He says, I'm, man, he says, coach, I'm kind of nervous. I said, well, do you know why you're nervous? And uh, all my guys know to answer because we've created this self-awareness through the no fear program and i'm wearing wow. the t-shirt k-n-o-w no fear for those people just listening to the audio version of this but you know when he articulated he said because i want to do a good job because i want to make you proud in other words 
he wasn't he knew exactly what he had to dial into mm. it wasn't like this randomized fear where you know you're about to do something and all of a sudden your heart's doing this and, you, and, and this is what would happen to me as a kid it's kind of like a really long answer to that but it, but it explains why our system is so holistic and why it almost has these overtones of a of a like self-actualization spiritual sense even though you know we can delve into pretty, some pretty hardcore force on force stuff it was always holistic it was always about the emotional psychological physical intersections recognizing and i figured this out in the 80s through intuition and experimentation that uh in a high stress situation your conscious cognitive situational awareness can be compromised when that happens our survival system will do its best to try and protect us protect our mind body and spirit and that is manifesting a startle flinch push away danger cover the head yep and you can't override that but you can incorporate that into your knowledge so you you know I, I would interview operators from different tier one units and I go, Hey, what'd you do? You ever been in ambush? And I specifically who's been in ambush that guy. Okay. Hey, one interview when you were in the ambush, what did you do? Oh, immediate action drill. Okay. what did you do before immediate action? Because for people who don't know, and they probably should know if they're fans of your show, immediate action, return fire, get offline, charge a threat, return fire, blah, 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 et cetera. It's a trained movement, right? You create a neural pattern. Uh, you develop your mind speed by drilling, 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 drilling. But I would say to them, what did you do before the immediate action? They go, I don't know what you mean. And it takes about five to 10 minutes of me needling them and probing and poking. And then they all realize that what they did, and they're sitting in their car or they're walking and friggin' rounds start whipping by, that they all went, whoa, they all flinched, covered their head, hands went up. Uh, and then very quickly the brain recalibrates contact they drop to the ground get offline and then they move yeah my contention my hypothesis and this is why i work with like and, it, and it's funny because there, there's two mindsets in the because i'll work with like professional let's say mma boxer like a con combat sports but also uh uh people in the combat sphere right the, you know in different different agencies and organizations all over the world some of them are like do you remember the original roadhouse right i thought <laughs> he'd be bigger and then and then some of them are like wait a minute this is about the neurobiology of survival this is about neuroscience this guy is talking about signal speed and refractory delay between stimulus response um and uh uh I get nerdy on this stuff. When I, if I'm relaxed with you, which I am, my brain does this. Your audience is probably going, "What did he just say?" No, you, you're like me. You, you, you're linking all those things in your brain back to, back to, and then, then and bring it together in that succinct thing. Um, can I just give an example there that if you tie some of your stuff together, and then we can carry that on? Sure. Uh, Clint Emerson. Um, I'm not sure if you know Clint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, quite well. Yeah, awesome. So. Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 6, CIA, and funny as hell guy. Um, he was actually supposed to be on the show with um, a Delta operator and a SAS guy. Um, just starting his audio book. Uh, what is it? For 100 Daily Skills? No, no, no. This one is uh, the right kind of crazy. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he tells a story, Tony. So you do this great thing, especially on the, the videos lately, of someone's ambushing you from a car, some somebody's driven up and they're gonna get out of their car and, and do bad things. Well, he gets ambushed, uh, 100 mile an hour plus, uh, being followed by, he didn't know at the time, at night, um, three Mexican carjackers, all armed. Anyway, long story short, the first thing that the super experienced combat veteran experiences is sweaty palms, heart rate goes up, tunnel vision comes in, he's highly trained um, Tony, as you know, but for everybody else, we all go through this and then he switches on the training and he stops the vehicle. The other people stop the vehicle. He doesn't draw his gun. He goes running up to the door. The first guy steps down his, his leg onto the ground. Clint kicks the door, snaps his tibia, his lower leg in half. Beautiful. Did and you know, I just, on. I just, this week I released a video about that. Yeah. That was crazy. Huh? Yes. I got to call I just wanted to, to 
um, share that story because it ties in a very applicable way of showing that's normal. It's very normal to have that fear response and we can't out train it, but we can change the time between when it happens and how we can react and save our lives. Yeah, and that's what I talk about is recalibrate your, when a stimulus is introduced too quickly, uh, particularly a violent, dangerous stimulus, your executive function can be hijacked, uh, which means you can't access your, your cognitive brain, which is where you saved all of your, I'll do this when this happens. And now your reactive brain or reptilian brain kicks in, fight, flight, freeze, stop the startle, flinch, cover the head, push away danger. What we what we do in our training is we help people recalibrate quickly so that the gap time between stimulus response is as short as possible. Uh, you know, if, if Clint got into three more uh, chases like that uh, each day, we would notice the the refractory delay between his first conscious awareness I'm being followed, which was let's say maybe 42 seconds in this one when he's driving, he's going, fuck, I'm gonna die tonight. Shit, why didn't I, you know, why don't I have three guys in me? Why is my car armor? Where am I gonna go? I don't know where a hospital is. What whatever he's thinking, until he finally goes, dude, if you don't get your shit together, something bad's gonna happen. You know how to fight, you know what to do. So if that happened again, if that happened on a Saturday and then it happened on a Sunday, it, 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 let's say it was 45 seconds on Saturday, maybe it's 20 or 30 seconds on Sunday because he's got to go through. I don't believe this just happened yesterday. I always make this joke that, that and this is, this is uh, um, you know, the, the no fear program is probably the most important thing that, that my company's developed in, in the last 30, 40 years. Because I discovered in doing scenarios that only people who manage their fear manage to fight. And it's a heavy line. I want to say it again, share with your audience. If you manage your fear, you will manage the fight. It doesn't guarantee that you win, but it guarantees that you get in the fight. And and the mind navigates the body. We, We need to give ourselves permission to protect ourselves. We need to give ourselves permission to dominate, to win. Uh, and, and, um, uh, it's, it's beyond like just a battle cry. Yeah, let's go. It's, it's our, it's understanding our self-talk and our self-talk, the way we coach ourselves with that silent coach in the back of your head, where I, I, I make, I, I refer to it as your, it's, it's, you want to create a relationship with fear so that it's your co-pilot, not your backseat driver. You know, the backseat driver is like, you're driving, you go, man, you're not going to get there. You're not going to do it. You missed your fucking turn. You should have trained more. You don't have enough ammo. You know, who are you? Imposter syndrome, whatever, whatever it is. Versus I get a fear spike and I metaphorically turn over to the passenger side and I say, you better put your seatbelt on because we're going about, we're about to go fast, right? Because fear becomes the fuel if you understand how to lean into it. Now, let's go back to your question. Nine hours later, how did this start? <laughs> I lived with this fear for for 25 years with everything, right? It wasn't until I was 25 heavy into my scenario-based training, living in Montreal, Canada at the time. And we were doing like Fight Club before Fight Club was a movie, but we were wearing protective gear, baseball shin guards, hockey gauntlets, uh, literally hockey helmets with cages and headbutting and elbows and beating each other with six on ones, four on twos, just replicating any, we'd see something in the news, let's let's replicate that. Someone come in and go, hey, this almost happened to me. Okay, let's play that out. And came up with crazy stuff. And I noticed that we got this reputation, like once a month, people would show up, like you'd show up. I don't know you, you'd sign a waiver release. We talk about this, like I, I had a maxim training should hurt, but should never injure. If I think you're trying to injure somebody, you will be, uh, uh, ejected with extreme prejudice from the training. Uh, we're not here to hurt each other. Uh, sorry, we're not here to injure each other, but we will hurt each other, and yeah. because we'll become more resilient, right? Yeah, kind of, kind of a modification of the Nietzsche: "What doesn't kill you makes you stronger." Um, but it was fascinating, Damien, because that was my the '80s were my incubator period. It's when I, I I designed. It's when I discovered startle flinch and started to develop the spear system. I didn't start with an acronym. Right, spontaneous mm-hmm. protection enabling accelerated response. That's a cool acronym. Like, <laughs> it, it like it started off with, yeah. you know, 
doing a drill where it's like, what the fuck? Like noticing that my, my flinch response was more functional than my learned complex motor skills in high stress, extreme close quarters. Let's just unpack that, Tony, because yep. you and I speak from an educator point of view, you an expert, me a bit of education. Your, your startle and flinch response that you naturally do and all people naturally do is better at protecting you than a really highly trained uh, skill. Is, that's what yeah. you're saying, right? Yeah. So, so here I am super, so I, uh, so I, I hallucinated this drill called the sucker punch drill, where I, I said to one of my students who's a really good boxer, I said, Warren, we're always doing stuff in the, in the ring or a scenario where I go, go stand over there. And then someone come up pretending to be a drunk or part of a gang member or whatever, but it was a scenario and you were trying to detect, defuse, defend, uh, organize it. We would do them in the streets. Sometimes we do them in real environments. Uh, but we didn't surgically analyze what is now what I call a PIA, a primary initiation attack. Mm -hmm. In other words, in America, headbutting isn't a big thing. Yeah, It happens, but it's not a big thing. You go to Scotland, it's a PIA, right? You're in a pub and you're not from around there. And some guy will walk up to you and go, what did you say? Quack! You know, and, and he'll smash you. We don't do that in America. So the PIA thing was big. In America, you got the John Wayne sucker punch. You got a violent shove. You got a tackle. So I created this, this system where depending on where you were, if you were doing prisoner handling overseas, like if I said to you, what are the odds, Damien, of you ever getting a double mule kick to the face or to the sternum in a fight? Well, <laughs> most people, when I ask them, they start laughing like you just did. I said, what about if you're on convoy detail and you're unloading detainees from a flatbed truck. Yeah, yeah. Now suddenly that's the number one threat. Yeah. It's amazing. So we've created, I got goosebumps now thinking like our stuff is so precise. And I started getting into the surgical detail. It's like, instead of sparring, what if we reverse engineered? We looked at the event and we identified the PIA, the primary initiation attack for that. You've got, you know, if I said to you, uh, someone's going to bite your face off or nose. Like, what are the chances of that? Well, you know, you go like, I've never even seen that. When then I show a video of a correctional officer walking a shackled, you know, prisoner, yeah. ankles, feet, and the guy stops and the guy goes, what are you stopping for? And the guy goes, <clears throat> and it just like starts biting his face. Wow. So we, we work with a lot of prison services. So explaining them, hey, you work here, this is your threat. Now, think about this. If I asked you, I'm off on a crazy tangent here, but it's fun. If I asked you generically, we bumped into each other in, in, in a pub, and you went, hey, you're Tony Blower. I heard about you. You teach self-defense. And I said, Damien, how many ways can you be attacked in, in a street, uh, like a street fight? Mm -hmm. The default answer without throwing you under the bus and, and is, is, I don't know, fuck, a million? Yeah. Like that, exactly. zillions of ways. That's what the general public and everyone listening that's what we carry around with us at an, at an unconscious level that induces a lot of fear and worry when events start to unfold. Yeah. But what if I said there's a system out there where you could look at where you are and who you're with and, uh, and, and distill the, the types of attacks to a manageable number. So for example, uh, if you work in the jail, you've got, there's three or four classic PIAs. Now, suddenly, if I say to you, you're full-time prison guard, instead of walking around going, man, there's hundreds of things that could be a, that could happen to me. Wait a minute, I heard once some martial art guy said there's a counter for every counter. That means there's an infinity square. <laughs> Holy fuck. Like, and you start thinking analysis about reaction. By analysis. Yeah. You and suddenly you're like, ah, as opposed to I knew he was gonna do that. Why? Because the training predicted it yeah right and so uh it, it's uh it's a it's an interesting thing it's a predictive model for you know these like dynamic fluid situations and it's pretty freaking accurate uh and here's a, a neat thing you'll get this some of your listeners will get it but it's a bit nerdy if i say to you like this is the fastest thing that this threat could do here therefore the most dangerous thing mm -hmm. and we go yeah and they go, but he could do this too, right? Or this too, or this too, yeah. So let's say you're a police officer standing there 
inside reactionary gap. And the guy goes, well, listen, man, I don't have any idea. I'm whack, and he throws a punch. Yeah. The cop could go, but he could grab my gun too. Yeah, but your gun's in your holster. So he could have grabbed your gun, but you could punch him in the throat or do a disarm or break his elbow or sweep him. Uh, but if he punches you in the face and stuns you or knocks you out, then he can grab your gun without you trying to protect it. Exactly. So the gun threat is real, but the PIA, the most dangerous one would be a quick sucker punch. Yeah. So then you go, oh, fuck. So we got sucker punch, gun grab. Well, what about a tackle? Tackle sucks too. You're on your back, but you can protect your gun. You could maybe rule the guy. You could, you know, uh, study some ground uh, fighting, which we teach, but I also recommend get to Gracie's survival tactics, get to a really good, don't be afraid of the ground. The, the, the most dangerous person on the ground is somebody who's trained it. The hardest person to take to the ground is also somebody who's not afraid to the ground. But anyways, so when you break that down, you go, okay, so we got sucker punch, we got gun grab, we got tackle. Those are the three big ones for a cop. But I go, listen, the most dangerous one is still the sucker punch because I can go, hey, man, you got me surrender position. And I go, officer, clip, and now you're stunned. That's the only one that can knock you out right away. The other two aren't going to. People are like, oh, okay. And then I say to them, if you're ready for the fastest thing they could do, you're automatically ready for something slower. Yeah. So you can intercept the slower. This is just the way this, this. So we help people develop mind speed, decision making, but also blending auditory, visual, tactile cues. So we got nerdy there. Sorry, audience. I still haven't answered how I started. Just want to point that out. But, uh, but where we are, Tony, I've got. I was just saying it yesterday. I can't believe it that a, a, a you know a shooter and now a fireman is doing interviews with with uh, online. Um, on that tangent, I had a question of uh, mindset versus skill set. I think you've really uh, intimated around that. Uh, I know my answer, but what do you think is more important, mindset versus skill set? Uh, depending on the event, but in general. Um, so for example, depending on the event, I need you to do a tracheotomy. We just, I just got punched in the throat. Uh, 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 you killed the bad guy and I'm going, Hey man, do a tracheotomy. And you go, I'm game to do it, but I have no clue how right. you, know, you end up killing me. <laughs> so, so it depends on the event. Yeah. Um, in general mindset, Trump skill set. And it and and I and I tell people this all the time. I've studied violence, fear, and aggression for decades, and I've talked to victims. I've talked to victors, and this is going back since the '80s. Been, I've been fascinated on this since 1980, when my first student Mitch lost lost the fight, and I changed everything about how I taught that day forward. But uh, I wrote an article for Inside Karate Magazine in, in uh, 1986, and. In it was a line, I'm sort of paraphrasing it here, is that there are more people who protect themselves every day through sheer will and indignation and have absolutely zero training than there ever will be trained people who get attacked and successfully defend themselves. And it was just this hypothesis statement because the, the again, it goes back to that line I shared earlier, the people who manage their fear manage to fight. And... There's lots of, and you've seen it, you might have even seen it live, but you've certainly seen it on TV news. Train people, don't do it, they can't get their gun out. Don't move, can't pull the trigger. Uh, uh, violence where you're going, shit, they're not even doing anything. They're just like, like I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. Um, the If you can't manage what's going on in here, and, and you know, we get very nuanced in this where i explain like everyone says hey head on a swivel left to bang you know situational awareness and of course that's valid and, and super important but the reality is this that it's self-awareness that acts on situational awareness self-awareness informs the rest of the mind about situation so if i go I go, wow, that's really suspicious behavior there, but I'm profiling and I'll get in trouble. If I say something here, then I'm going to be, shit, I don't want to get involved. That's not recognizing I'm in the fear loop. I, my, my survival system said there's something wrong there. And then I talk myself out of it because I'm in, in, in the fear loop. And then something happens and I've got this PTSD guilt. 
Uh, and, and you see this all over the world right now, especially with the cancel culture. Uh, but every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling after the attack. Yeah. Uh, uh, or sorry, they had a bad feeling before the attack. What I mean is after the attack. When, if they lived to tell the tale and they were interviewed, they said, I hope that came up. That, that sounded weird as I said it. Everyone who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack, meaning they were injured after the attack. They lived and someone said, I knew something was off. I knew something was wrong. But they, exactly didn't, have, they didn't have the self-awareness slash courage to act on it. Why? The blinders on this can't be happening. We go into denial. I don't want this to happen. I don't want to deal with this. Uh, and um, And this goes for like trained people too. Well, that's yeah. that's where I wanted to go. I'm glad we, we got there. Um, Chris McDougall has written two books. One was Born to Run. That's not relevant to this. Amazing book. But the next book um, is a, uh, talks about heroes. And in it, he talks about like the grandma hero who, who goes and, and takes on a couple of attackers, um, a, a person who goes into the burning building. But you're talking about the people, they realize something's off and they're not trained but they've got the mindset to then go, I have to act. Now there's right. those people that naturally did it and they're, they're on the television as heroes. But from what I'm getting with your no fear program and the, the modern side of what you're doing, Tony, you're teaching people how to embrace that, develop and, and, and comprehend how to act. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it's uh, um, that, that, that's a great, a great summary. I my, like I believe that everyone knows what the right thing to do is. Let's 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 uh, cast aside the asocial predators, people with you know mental health issues, stuff like that. Normal people, normal people know I should help this person here. I should hold this door here. I should be polite here. I should say thank you here. I should. That woman is crying for help. That kid looks scared and lost, and they're walking with a man. I I don't want to get involved. Like. I, I should say something. So I always say like, like we call this the three eyes, instincts, intuition, intelligence. Your instincts, you know, they're, that's like kind of a hardwired signaling radar system. Your intuition is when something in the world whispers in your ear and you know it to be true. You just don't know why it's true or if it's true yet. Right. And, we, and we don't, and we aren't taught to be curious in a, strategic way right and when we say strategic way because like if 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 it's a, a a premonition or an idea for danger we don't want to go you know hey are you following me and like maybe we need to be a little bit more clandestine in how we evaluate whether we are in danger or not um so so yeah it, the whole no fear program is about teaching people how to choose courage so fear is contagious but so is courage one of my favorite lines out of the program that I'm happy to share with your audience is, is this, you can't be brave if you're not afraid. You can't be brave if you're not afraid. And, and what that means is, is given the choice, all humans would choose to be courageous, would choose to be brave. But what we do, if we don't think this goes back to skill set mindset, someone goes, but I don't know what to do. Whereas in, in McDougal's book and heroes and stuff like that, like the person that runs into the burning building, they could have easily said, I'm not a fireman. I have no idea how to run into a burning building, but something compelled them. They, someone screamed, my, my cat's in there, my dog's in there, my kid's in there. Someone said, my grandma's in there. And that person just went, and it was that if, if not who, if not me, then who type, type moment. Beautiful. And then they're always asked after, you know, you're a hero. <clears throat> and they always say something like, no, I'm not. I just did what I hope someone would do for me or my family. We have a big block. We talk about the courageous bystander in our training. That's uh, interesting, yeah. And, and, and what, is it, what does it mean uh, to do that and, and, and to, be that, uh, to be that person? It's interesting you bring up uh, the, the fire as an example. Um, at a seminar I did last yeah, it was last summer in Florida. We had about 63 people there, plus my team. And one of the guys in the front row there with his teenage son was a professional firefighter. And he had int he introduced himself to me and he told me what he did. And I said, well, thank you for your service. Da, 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 da. And a little bit later, because he said firefighter, I use this example. 
in class, I said to the 62 people there, I said, how many of you know that you would run into a burning building to save another human or, or a pet's life? How many of you know for a fact? And a woman uh, near the front row puts her hand up. She says, well, with all the knowledge we're gaining from um, uh, the program, we'd like to, I'd like to think that we would be able to do that. I said, okay, I'm not looking for a testimonial. I, what I'm asking is like, do you know? Is there anyone here in the room? And I, I told him I was going to ask this question. I said, wait, and then put your hand up when it's obvious to put your hands up. <laughs> and I go, is there anyone here who knows 100% for certain they would run into a burning building? His hand goes up. And I go, you cocky bastard. Like no one's, like 62 people are going, <laughs> I hope I do the right thing. And you know you're, how do you know you're going to run into a building, burning building? And he looks at everybody, he goes, because I'm a fireman. Right? And everyone laughs, right? Yeah, yeah. But it was that moment where mindset and skill set, you know, connect and yeah. you realize I know exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, but but the question and the challenge is, is like, if you know what to do, like, I don't know if you remember years ago, and, and I mean, you live overseas, so it might not have been news. A plane went went down into the Potomac River outside of Washington. Ah, yeah. It's yeah. icy icy uh, uh, river. And one guy jumped in and swam and rec rescued uh, people while other people s stood on the beach. My wow. intention is everyone on the beach is going, someone do something, someone do something. And here's a guy who takes his jeans off, pants off. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm just assuming he didn't sw like, you know, swim with shoes, but maybe he did. Jumped in and swam and started pulling, you know, uh, uh, people out. But everyone on the shore was going, amazing, good job. Yeah, but like, why aren't you in the water? Yeah, yeah um, exactly. There, so there's a neat thing that we do in the No Fear program. We talk about. And I, I think we're probably the only company that does this, and it's 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 a subtle trade secret. So I'm I'm, it's not a, it's not like classified enough to kill everyone after they tell it. <laughs> and don't right. say that on Facebook. I I, I did right. the Top Gun line. I was banned for a month. <laughs> nice, um, but everyone talks about the when they talk about fear and arousal and fight flight freeze, they're talking about the physiology. And the biochemical, the, the neuroscience of fear and what it does to our body. Yeah. Our focus is on the psychology of fear. Because whether you get an adrenaline dump or not isn't what's important. It's what you're thinking because the mind navigates the body. So our focus is on, you know, you, you know, you're outside of a stack, you got sucked into, you know, you get sucked into a room. Uh, uh, where you're not supposed to go in alone, right? I'm, I'm, I'm talking cool guys, CQB stuff here, yeah. fans uh, fans of, of Damien's and special operations. And you're in there and suddenly you realize you're, you're in this room alone and you're like, fuck, what are I, oh man. And and you're, you're waiting, but you don't want to go, hey, like you're, you're trying to be discreet about yeah. this. Your heart's racing. You realize you fucked up. Now our brain is going, oh man, I'm fucked. I'm lost. I'm turned around. I don't know which way's out. Or you go, I know exactly what to do. I know how to get out of here. I, I've done loan operator training. If I was point and I had 11 guys behind me, I'd be moving. Yeah. You just fucking switch gears. Like, and that's what Clint did in his, in his situation. Exactly. Like, exactly switch yeah. those gears. So that is to me simply about managing the psychology of fear and it has nothing to do with your heart rate, your sweaty palms, shallow breathing, you, that will dissipate. Here's an interesting thing. All of us listening to this have been speeding somewhere, right? At some point, and then come over a hill and there's a cop there. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you immediately hit the brakes, you check your seatbelts on, you're slowing down, you're like, oh fuck, I'm gonna get a ticket. And then you realize he's looking down, he's writing someone else a ticket, he's just finished writing a ticket. And you realize you're safe, you're not gonna get a ticket, but within three seconds of all of the recognition, you still get an adrenaline dump. Yep. You're not running, you're not sprinting, you're not hitting a bag, you're not in a fight, but your heart is racing. You've got butterflies in your stomach and you're sitting in your seat, <laughs> driving. So, the, so this is a fun visual that our body can run a physiological fear spike independent of our brain, because our brain said we're safe, but now the neurochemicals need some time to dissipate and run out. Yep. So we... 
we're very big on helping people realize like it doesn't matter what people go oh your heart rate should be here for optimal i go blah 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 you don't know you know like you're low crawling through a threat and gunfire is going over your head if you had a polar heart rate monitor on your heart rate's not like 120 or <laughs> 95 but you're so focused on your mission that you don't even care what's going on there yeah uh, i had one of my guys just as an example it was for a, an mma fight he actually won the title but on this i had him doing sprints on a treadmill we would get his heart rate up to 180 he would jump off of a 400 meter sprint immediately go into some pummeling then like shirk the guy away and then right into some pad work and into some some uh complex move like an ankle lock knee bar uh arm bar stuff but we would do it we would quickly cycle it while his heart rate peaked at 180. yeah and and i was explaining to people that if you listen to experts who don't know how to fight they'll say you can't function at 180. <laughs> and I go, no, a guy like you and, and, and Clint and, and some of the other guys from, from some of the uh, tier one, these guys are shooting people in the face, picking targets, and only the sniper, I always make a joke, the only one cool, calm, and collected in a gunfight is a sniper. Yeah, Everyone, yeah, right everyone else is like, it just in the zone, and you're just flowing. Yeah. So, anyways, with you know with back to Clint, though, and it's great, <clears throat> amazing, uh, uh, synchronicity that I, I listened to it uh, yesterday for this show uh he's again a highly trained combat veteran uh he broke he kicked the door and broke that guy's leg and then the other the passengers got out and he's drawn a weapon and the passenger had a weapon and next thing clint hears the cops screech up and blue and blue and red lights under that pressure clint totally tunnel visioned on the threat he can't beat his physiology he hasn't been in a situation before where he was he'd done that he'd done this stuff in afghan iraq all the places but literally he was the perfect example of all the things you're you're uh showing tony that the humans naturally do he tunnel visioned he didn't know the cops were there until he heard them say get down right yeah uh, uh and, and that's that's uh tacky psyche big fancy word for things going into slow motion auditory exclusion he didn't hear maybe their first three commands absolutely uh, tunnel vision uh and that's normally you know uh what you do when you're locked in with a tactical imperative what's interesting is if you are um going in the other direction where you've given up you notice things that are distracting i was talking to a cop once who was in a fight where the guy was trying to kill him this big guy had they were fighting in a vehicle this guy was so strong he slammed the officer up on the ceiling of the car wow he's got his arm across and actually like a spear outside 90 fingers plate and he's yeah. pinned in here and he's grabbing his gun screaming i'm gonna kill you and this cop's getting choked hanging upside down from the car like this wow hitting and and he's debriefing me on this and he says um he says, and he had just graduated like a, a couple months earlier, my officer survival training. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, got, got uh, uh, he had a, to, to set it up how they got in the car is he stopped this guy who was on a stolen bike. The guy uh, suckered and dropped him. They fought on the ground. He OC'd him. The guy, you know, fought through that, hit the cop. Cop falls back. And when he stopped the guy quickly, he got out of his car quick and went to him and left his car open it was off but the guy got in there to steal his car right wow so he jumps in the car and he's trying to figure out how to start it yeah and uh the officer runs over opens the door grabs the guy but this guy is like this the, the cop was like 170 he was he, he was like a runner he yeah. used to run 10 miles a day i fucking hate him right so uh <laughs> I hate guys like to run. but um um but the guy, when he got grabbed like this, he just grabbed him boom, and pulled him in and they fell into the car. So now he's up here and he's on the guy's gun. And uh, he says the craziest thing. Uh, there's something I tell people, I go, I go weapon, re weapon retention is your holster. Weapon protection is your mindset. Right. Good. If somebody's trying to grab your gun, let him grab your gun and smash him. He, if you got a fairly modern holster, nobody can pull your gun out before you can hit them 
three, four, five, six times in the throat and the head. And trust me, if if you know if you're down here and I go reach through the internet here, Damien, and grab my gun <laughs> yeah, with yeah. both hands, and as you're reaching, I go whack, 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 and I'm nailing you, elbows, forearms, gouging your eyes. Yeah. I guarantee that your nervous system is going to stop focusing on my gun. Absolutely. What we explain to people is we can trigger the physiology of the suspect or the threat in the same way if i do something and i move at you like in the same way physiology can sometimes interfere with our complex motor skill that's a two-way range when, when you're fighting and if you understand it you can apply it but anyways he's over the guy and, and this is the, the the thing we're talking about tunnel vision auditory exclusion and and uh um uh what was the other thing uh, tunnel vision auditory exclusion and tacky psyche things going to slow motion so where clint he had a tactical imperative he had switched gears and now he was clint the badass operator somebody who gives up even if they're trained because this cop was trained but he's up there he's he's losing oxygen to the brain and he he says to me i'm hanging up i'm up here the guy's on my gun. He's going, I'm going to fucking kill you, cop. I'm going to kill you. And he's struggling. And I feel like I'm passing out. And all I could think of was I looked through the window in front of me and I saw there was a, a red Dodge Ram truck. And I was thinking, wow, that's a really nice truck. I'd oh, love to have a truck like that. And then I'm thinking about my family and the truck. And, and he looks at me, goes, why was that? And I said, like, that's just part of your brain. Go, they're trying to distract you from the problem because there's a part of you that didn't believe you could solve the problem. And it was a really heavy moment. Mm. And I said, what snapped you out of it? And, and um, uh, he, he said it was me remembering in class, you saying weapon retention is your holster, weapon protection is your mindset. If someone's grabbing your gun, fuck him up. You need to move right to the head, right to the throat. Mm -hmm. And because his hands are down if he's on your gun. Yeah. And uh, what was amazing at that moment, upside down, he, because he was trying to peel the, the forearm across his throat, trying to peel it off, but he couldn't because the guy was wedged and big. Yep. But his other hand was down here, pinning his hand to the top of his pistol. Yep. And he just, Sorry, did you say that again? he was pinning his hand, Siri, to stop eavesdropping. <laughs> Siri, right. But but it was an amazing moment, man, where he's up over here and, and the head, where's a, a fucking ball here? I'll just show it, I'll show it to you what it looked like. You know, this guy's down here like this, and he's up here, pinning here. Yeah. And it's a move that we teach. Forget the gun, release it, boom, and he just drops an elbow from here up on top, wow. hanging out. Release that. So the guy's on there, yeah. whack, and just came down with an elbow. Did it twice, knocked the guy out. Um, yeah it was insane wow um, look get me all excited I haven't told that, that <laughs> you're so passionate I, I get um, slammed for that all the time when, when I get into into things I enjoy um, that brings me to the question then because I originally asked for your history and then we go on well past that yes. it pushes to, the, to this question is that what's the difference between martial arts and combat 